So, how'd you like to join me on page 132, module four, molecular structures. All right, now we're getting into some chemistry. <laughs> and now you've been away for a couple days, you're gone soft, right? Molecular structures. And not surprisingly, molecular structures begins with a review of electron configuration diagrams. So electron configuration is the key to understanding molecular structures. If you remember, the electron configuration diagram shows us or explains to us where the different orbitals that the electrons probably exist, where they tend to exist. The current model of the quantum mechanical model is a location of probability. In other words, we don't have distinct orbits like in a Bohr model, or we don't have a singular orbit like the first, you know, Bohr started singular and then multi later on developed with multiple orbits, but they're all kind of flat, looked like a solar system. Or then maybe we figured it was three-dimensional, and so we've got this nucleus with things rotating around it. We still see those, like, and consider that to be the picture of an atom. But now you guys are a little bit more educated, and you understand that they're actually orbitals that are spherical, called S-shells, those that look like dumbbells. And by that, I don't mean your neighbor. I mean they look like propellers, okay? In the P-shell, and the P shell, the P orbitals, in those P orbitals, there's three P orbitals. Each one contains two electrons for a total of six. The D orbitals, there are five D orbitals, each with two electrons for a total of 10. There are seven F orbitals, two each for a total of 14 electrons. And last module we discussed how in the periodic, periodic table, we can see that structure just from the way the periodic table is set up. We mentioned that these first two columns, they represent elements whose valence electrons, that's part of this module, we started talking about it last module, their valence electrons, their highest energy level electrons, think of them as the outermost electrons, okay? Where do they exist? Well, everything in column 1A, their outermost electrons exist in the S1 orbital. So it's 1s1, 2s1, 3s1, and so on. Different energy levels, the s orbital, the first electron in the s orbital. The second column for every energy level, the valence electrons exist in the s orbital, but they fill both the s1 and s2 positions. So everything in column two, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and so on, they all have an s2 electron. We're gonna skip all the way over to the p's, and say for every energy level, when the electron exists in the third column, see underneath here where it says 3A? On top it says 13, below it says 3A. I'm making a general statement which I'll review from the book in just a moment. I'm giving you a quick overview, and then we're gonna go through it in a little more detail. But every electron over here, they exist, they have electrons, and their outermost, their valence shell electrons are in the P orbital of one of those different energy levels. Energy level one, two, three, four, five. Remember, the energy level is the row, and that's kind of the first identifier. The higher the energy level, the farther, think of it this way, the farther it tends to be away from the nucleus, or the farther it can be away from the nucleus. It's a higher energy level. Then within that, there are S, P, D, and F orbitals. If the element exists on the periodic table over here, between column 3A and, which would be considered column 8A, they have electrons that are in the p orbitals, filling each of those positions one through six. Okay. Well, so one of the tricks to this, this one is written here with a group 1a, 2a, then across here goes 3a all the way up to 7a, and then it goes to zero. Consider that to be 8a, if you use this chart. And one of the tricks to figuring out how many electrons does the that orbital have total is to figure out what column it's in. See column one, they all have one S, they all have S1. Column two, they all have an S2. Column three, they all have a P1, right? A P2, a P3, a P4, a P5, and a P6 on each different energy level. We're gonna learn really quickly here that that also tells you the column they're in, it tells you how many valence electrons they have total. Because as I said, one and two are straightforward. How many valence electrons does something in column one have? It has one. How many electrons does column two have? It has two. Over here, 
How many does column three have? It has three. Column four, they have four and so on, all the way up to eight. What throws it off are these D columns in here, the three, or excuse me, the B columns that take place over the D orbitals and the F orbitals, where you have three B through, and it gets funky in here, through eight B. We'll explain why that's a little bit different later on. But remember, when you're in these positions on the periodic table and you're building your electron configurations, you're in the D orbitals. And remember the trick with the D orbitals is they always go back in energy level, right? So in order to get to a, in this case, a 3D1, you would already have placed a 4S2. And so the 4S2 is actually the higher energy level for our purposes now than the 3D1. Okay, so the D blocks, if you, if you do your electron configurations right, you're just going to basically write an electron configuration, then look for the highest energy level, and then count up the electrons that are in that energy level. Okay, so we're going to start on the book, walk through some of what we've just done, again, even though we've just done it, <coughs> and bring us to the place where hopefully everything that I've just told you will make sense before we leave today. Electron configurations in the periodic table. Discussion on 132, and again, we've covered it in detail, but the key points coming over to 133 is that when forming a molecule, and when we talk about molecules, now we're talking about taking atoms, multiple atoms, and joining them together. Bringing more than one atom together to form a new structure called a molecule. We've covered that concept already. An element atom forms a compound when they combine that's known as a molecule. That structure is known as a molecule. The part of the atom that's the most significant, matter of fact, the only significant part between two atoms coming together and how they're going to come together, and you've heard me use this phrase before, the only significant part you really didn't know about weight, the way things behave chemically is based on their valence shell electrons, where we're going to learn about the outermost electrons. The chemical characteristics of every element is based upon its valence electrons. In other words, it's less significant that it has... 56 electrons than it is that its valence electrons are in the 6s1 and s2 positions. The fact that barium has an s2 that has two valence shell electrons is more important than it has 56 total electrons. So the number of valence shell electrons in every single element is going to be the key to figuring out how it behaves and why it behaves the way it does chemically. And again, we talk about valence, the, way, the reason it's most significant is we think about a Bohr atom, just with orbits around a nucleus, it's going to be those electrons which are the farthest away from the nucleus that are going to impact other atoms first. Remember I said in chemistry, one of the big things about quantum mechanics and quantum, quantum mechanical model is the fact that the atom is mostly empty space. And to argue that in, in real life, things never re really hit each other. If I were to go like this, my hand never actually hits the podium. The forces that repel the podium, that repel my hand, they come together and think of it like a force field. The two force fields hit, and that's why when you're watching your favorite superhero movie or comic, and you see these folks come across and they punch each other and they've got force fields, it's not as if there's nothing that happens. They're going to be hit with the same force, it's just going to penetrate through and be propagated by that force field. As a kid, I never really understood Superman because, yeah, you can stop a train, but the coefficient of friction on your foot is going to make it so Superman goes flying in the other direction because he can't just stand there. He's got to somehow become incredibly massive to get the weight of gravity to allow his muscles to stop the train. If he stands in front of the train and does this, he might be able to take the impact, you know, those kind of forces at play. So here... When we talk about two atoms coming together, the atoms never actually hit each other. Matter of fact, the nucleuses never even get close. If we were to make it to scale, if, if one of you were the nucleus of an atom and you had all your electrons spinning around you, like all your peeps just spinning all around you, schooling around you, right? Another atom that you're going to react with, you might form a molecule, your two groups might get together, but you two at the centers might be so far away you never even see each other because your circle of friends are so big. They're impacting each other that you never see each other. So nucleus, the nucleus of the atoms don't really come into play. Think of the nucleus as the reason why the electrons exist and the reason why the electrons are orbiting around the atom. 
and why there's a certain number of them. Based upon the number of protons, there's an equal number of electrons. Oh, and those electrons are going to fill in certain orbitals. And oh, there's going to be a valence electron. There's the key. The valence electrons. So that everything in this column, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, these are all going to behave extremely similarly. Because they are all in the same column, but what that means is they all have the same exact number of valence electrons. They all have one valence electron. That's why over here, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, they all behave extremely similarly. Why? They all have two valence shell electrons. They all exist in an S2 position. S1 and S2 are their two valence electrons. Over here, column three, getting the, getting the, the, the gist here. Beryllium, aluminum, these, they all behave very similarly because they all have three valence shell electrons because they're going to have a 1s they're going to have the s1 the s2 and the p1 of whatever energy level they're on and so on they all have four and so the reason calcium or excuse me carbon and silicon behave so similarly matter of fact there's a lot of science fiction movies and theories that you go to another planet and you come upon a silicon based life form this whole idea of a silicon-based life form comes from this principle that, you know what, we understand life as carbon-based life form. You're going to find out that so much of what we know about chemistry and so much about life is based upon some combination of carb carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, but a carbon is in the center. The carbon is the big connector in our understanding of life. Carbon is the center. It's the core. It's the key. But if we were to look at the periodic table of elements, what element is not carbon, but behaves the most similarly to carbon? It's going to be silicon. It has the same number of valence electrons as carbon, and valence electrons is the key to its chemical behavior. It's also the closest in size. It's only one energy level higher. So if you were to guess, if there was another type of life form where the molecules are all very, very similar to ours, but not exactly the same, what would be the difference? Well, many would speculate it would be it's based on silicon, not based on carbon. Because chemically, they behave so much alike. Okay. In the book on 133, they give you three different elements there, and they write out their full electron configuration. Now, you guys can read electron configurations now, so hopefully you look at that and say, they ask the question, how many valence electrons do each one of those have? Well, look, look at fluoride first. Fluorine, the very first one. What is its valence electron count? Well, if you read the rest of the page, you're going to see that each one of these is seven. So we'll give you the seven, but let's see if we can find where the seven are located. In fluorine, it's got a 1s2, 2s2, and 2p5 electrons. So it has two in the 1s level, it has two in the 2s level, it has five in the 2p level. How many total electrons does it have in its valence shell, its valence orbital? Well, what is its highest energy level? Look at the electron configuration. What is the highest large number you see preceding each one of the orbitals in its highest level? Do you see that it's a two? So the 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. The highest preceding number is a 2. If we had a 3s, we'd have to first of all have the 2p6, right? Because we need to fill up the, the p orbital for the second energy level. So you'd have a 2p6. Then the next one you would have when you build it would be a 3s1. If a 3 shows up, guess what? Then 3 is the highest, and we only look at the 3s. In this case, the highest energy level is a 2. So we look at all of the 2s. It says that we've got a 2p2 and 2p5, or excuse me, 2s2 and 2p5. 2s1, s2, 2p1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Column 7. Does it match that I have seven valence electrons? Yes. The s's and the p's count up to be seven, and it also happens to be in column 7a on my periodic table. 
So from both of those, I would say fluorine has seven valence electrons. Chlorine. Well, guess what? Chlorine is one energy level higher, but in the same column as, as fluorine. I would expect, without looking at the electron configuration, that my highest energy level is third energy level, and I've got two S's and five P's, again, just like fluorine. Check, the, check it out. Yep, see, we, we filled in the 2P6 position, and then we built from there with a 3S2 and a 3P5. So chlorine has seven valence electrons. And iodine. Now this is one that's a little bit tricky because we've got some D electrons in this configuration, right? Please look at the electron configuration in your book right now, the third one. Read across from left to right. You see where it goes from 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. Okay, if we stopped right there, what would be the highest, what would be the valence count for an element that ended at 3d10? What is the highest energy level? As we're looking from left to right, if we stopped at 3d10, what would be the highest energy level? Do you see that it would be 4? It'd be four, and the count would be, how many valence electrons are there then? Two, because it's 4s2. That's hypothetical. Now let's continue across on iodine. It goes to 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p5. With its full electron configuration for iodine, what is the highest energy level in that configuration? Number five, good Ray, it's five. The highest energy level is the fifth energy level. How many electrons are in that fifth energy level? Looking at your full configuration here. Correct. The, the fifth energy level with seven electrons in the 5s2 and in the 5p5 orbitals. Counting 5s1, 5s2, those are the two in the s orbital. Then 5p1 and 2, 3 and 4, and then five. We would see that from the periodic table over here by saying, look at I've got iodine way over here. It's in the fifth energy level. So my highest energy level is the fifth energy level. It has, uh, it has electrons in the five S1 and two positions and in the five P one, two, three, four, and five positions. Are there electrons here? Yes, but what energy level are all of these D electrons? Fourth energy level, remember you subtract one. So if you have a five, if you fill Ds, they're going to be an energy level below the valence. So even though they fill later, they're of a lower energy level. So you need to remember that. Just because they're at the end of the electron configuration doesn't mean they're the highest. You need to look at the number in front of the orbitals to determine what is the highest energy level. So again, for iodine, it's 5s1, 5s2. 4D1, okay, that's four. That's one less than five. I'm not worried about that. Okay, now I get back over here to P. Now I go back up to the fifth energy level. P, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, my valence are all the fifth energy level electrons. The two in the S and the five in the P's. For a total of seven. All right. Flipping on over to 134. We already talked about this, that atoms in the same column have, on the periodic table have the same number of valence electrons, so they have very similar chemistry and their chemical behavior. We've already covered that. The next thing in the book they talk about are the noble gases. And we, again, have talked about this the last time we were together, through the last module. But the noble gases are the ones to the far right column over here on the periodic table. Now, what did I tell you about the noble gases? Do you remember? Go ahead, Will. Yeah, they're stable. They're satisfied. They don't want to react. If they don't want to react, then what does it tell you chemically about them? There's something about what that makes them not want to react. They're valence electrons, right? I said valence electrons, the valence electrons have, have everything to do with how elements and atoms react chemically. If those atoms don't want to react chemically, there must be something about their valence electron configuration 
that makes them not want to get involved with sharing or swapping or do anything like that. They just want to be left alone. Why? Well, if you notice over here, how many electrons are in the valence shell of every noble gas? What column would they be in? Column, not one, two, three, four. What column is the far right? It's not marked that way on this chart. But it's the column, column eight. It would be column 8A. How many valence electrons then do they have? If they're in column 8A, they have how many in their valence orbitals, their valence shell? If they're in column 8. If column 1 has 1, and column 2 has 2, and column 3 has 3, and column 4 has 4, and column 5 has 5, and column 6 has 6, and column 7 has 7, how many does 8 have? 8! It has 8 electrons in its valence shell. There's something about having 8 electrons in the valence shell that makes an atom not want to react with its neighbors. And what we define that as, if you look in here, it's called the octet rule. The octet rule is incredibly important for you to understand. Incredibly important. The octet rule. Now what is octet? What does that mean, the word octet? If you have two, it's a duo, right? Three is a trio. Four is a quartet. What's an octet? Group of eight. The octet rule is, and I'll read it from the book and then we'll talk about it. It's on the page 134. The octet rule, most atoms strive to attain eight valence electrons. Now, I'm not going to apologize every time I do this, but remember I said, we're going to do a lot of personification. Make some anthropomorphic type analogies. What's that mean? I'm going to talk about elements as if they have feelings, if they have a purpose, as if they're self-determined. I mean, all those fallacies we have about people, we're going to apply those to atoms as well. <laughs> there was a joke in that, okay? But it's first day back after a break, so we'll keep going. Okay, so I'm going to say things like an element, an atom of an element wants to have eight valence electrons. I'm going to assert that. There's nothing in the atom that's going, man, I wish I had another electron. They're just responding to forces and the way God designed it according to his master blueprint, okay? But I'll use things like it wants to have to help us understand it better. I'm going to say that every, almost, virtually every atom wants to have eight valence electrons. Virtually every one of them. There are some exceptions. Now, if you have a question in the future that says, the octet rule says every atom wants to have eight, that's not completely accurate. The octet rule does account for a few exceptions. And those exceptions all want to have two. The exceptions are hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. Those four all want to have two valence electrons. Every other element wants to have eight valence electrons. Now this is another reason why helium is on that side of the periodic table, because even though it only has two electrons, it is considered one of the noble gases, because it doesn't want to react, and so it makes sense for noble gas purposes to have helium over here. It makes sense in terms of metals and nonmetals to have helium over here, on this side. But in terms of how it's reacting, its reactivity, Helium's over here because helium doesn't want to give up any electrons and helium doesn't want to get any electrons. It has two. And by having two, it is satisfying the octet rule. What's it, what it's going to come down to, is it easier to lose things or get things? We well, want to think about it. This will become important later when we talk about metals and nonmetals. Helium doesn't want anybody to mess with its electrons. It doesn't want anybody else's and it's not going to give any up. It's satisfied where it's at. In the same way that neon satisfied with its eight, argon satisfied with its eight, these gases, these noble gases, are also called inert gases. We covered that last module as well. But the inert gases, they don't want to play. They just want to be left alone. 
They have exactly what they need. They want to have eight. They've got eight. Just leave us alone. Everybody else is trying to be like them. Everybody else is either trying to get more so they will have eight or lose so they'll only have eight. So they're trying to gain up to eight or lose down to eight. Think about it this way. Calcium, it has two electrons in its s orbital, right? If it loses one, it has one electron in its fourth s, fourth level s1. So it's a four s1 is now its valence. How many does it have total in its valence? One. If it loses one more, just by losing two electrons, what does its electron configuration look like now? It ends in a p6. It now has eight in its or in its valence shell. By calcium losing two, it goes to eight electrons in its valence shell. It can lose two, or it can fight really hard to gain 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. What's it going to do? Lose two or gain 16? It's, remember, it's trying to do as little work as possible, right? <laughs> it's easier for it to lose two than it is for it to gain 16 because it's striving to have eight. And if it fills for this way, once it gets one more, it's going to have to go back to the 3D orbitals. Fill all of 3D and then build 4P1 and build up to 4P6. Much easier for it to lose two and fall back to the same configuration as argon. That's why when we wrote the abbreviated electron configuration, some, right? We abbreviated electron configuration, we abbreviated it with brackets and used the noble gas. Why? That's what they're trying to get to if they're losing. So by using your abbreviated electron configuration diagram, you can see the noble gas. And then if it builds up, you can say, wow, it's only one electron away from the noble gas. It's only two electrons away from the noble gas. You can see how it is relative to the preceding noble gas. Okay, so the octet rule says that virtually every element wants to have eight electrons in its valence shell. So, the exceptions being hydrogen, it would love to gain one, so it could be like helium. Lithium, it would like to lose one to be like helium. And beryllium would like to lose two to be like helium. Once you get over to boron here, boron's all about gaining one, two, three, four, five. Gaining five to get eight like neon. And from that point forward, every, every other element wants to gain or lose to get eight. The first four want to get to two. Everybody else wants to get to eight. It's incredibly important as we move on for reactions and structures forming molecules. Now there's a way that we can depict, and the way that we're going to often depict elements to figure out how they behave chemically using what's known as a Lewis dot structure or electron dot configuration. To be honest with you, I use both of them, electron dot and Lewis dot. I would prefer, if I were consistent, and this is a place where I'm inconsistent, it's because I've been trained using both terms, and both terms are accept ac acceptable. Lewis dot structures or electron dot configurations. Most chemists don't like the statement electron dot configurations because it pulls credit away from Lewis, the chemist who came up with this in the early 1900s kind of forgets who he was, like his contribution, right? And so most chemists like to call it the Lewis dot structure. Why? Because they believe that people that discover things should get credit by having their name on it. So it's the Lewis dot structure. It's not simply electron dot configuration. But it's used so often in texts both ways that when you, when you hear either term, they're talking about the same thing. So please make sure you understand that. We're going to actually draw a diagram, a little symbol that represents how many valence shell electrons are in each atom. And you can see a series of those on page 135. I'm just going to draw a couple of them because you have them in your book here. What they're doing is moving across the second energy level with these electron dot configurations. Now again, all we're concerned about is how many electrons are in the valence orbitals. The valence electrons. The highest energy level. How many are there? So, for example, in the book, here they talk about lithium, and they use lithium as the first example. Lithium, there's the chemical symbol for lithium, Li. Okay. Now, how many valence electrons does lithium have? Okay. 
one. How do you quickly determine that lithium has one valence electron? Okay, it's in column one. It has one. Where is that one at? Well, it's in the second energy level in the S1 position. So 2S1, so it would be 1S2, 2S1 would be its full electron configuration. How many valence? One in the 2S1 position. Now, here's the chemical symbol for lithium. How do we draw that? We put the chemical symbol of whatever element we're looking at, and then we put the number of dots. Each one represents one valence electron. Lithium has one, so we're going to put one dot to that point there. It works for every single element. We're just going to write the chemical symbol for the element and then put dots around it for how many, that it, how many valence electrons that it has. Now, on the other end of the extreme here, on second energy level, it goes all the way across to neon. Neon is, from the, from the table, you can see that it's an inert gas. It's a noble gas. Column 8A, eight valence electrons. So you would expect this would be the maximum number we have. So lithium having one or neon having eight. How do we draw that? Well, start with neon. Since we're drawing the configuration for neon, we're going to write the chemical symbol for neon. And then we're going to place the dots. Now, I'm going to place them in the order that we would build up any element. If, if that element, let's say that, let's for a minute, let's forget this is neon. Let's, it's any element from the first column, like lithium, it's going to have one dot to the side over here, right? If it's in the second column, it's going to have two electrons, and we're going to put that one at the bottom. If it's in the 3A, or underneath boron, for example, it'd be, have three. Then we move over to carbon, the fourth, it's like this, it has four. Moving past then to nitrogen, it would have five. On to oxygen, it would have six. Over to fluoride, has seven. And neon itself has eight. You see how I built that up? I started at the clock position of three. For those of you the old-fashioned clocks that had hands, like that, if you can still read those. We're starting at the 3 o'clock position, so it's right off to the right. And we just go around and build it up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If, pick another one. Let's go back to nitrogen. If we were drawing the Lewis dot structure for nitrogen, how many dots am I going to make for nitrogen? Okay, everybody see that? I said 5. It's a column 5A element. I'm looking for five. Where are the five going to be? Well, it's going to be in the 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 2p2, and 2p3. But for a total of five. Total of five. So I'm going to write down the chemical symbol for nitrogen, and I'm going to put five dots in place. One, two, three, four, five. There's my Lewis structure for nitrogen. So any element, you just write the chemical symbol for the element, Figure out how many valence electrons it has. Place the first one at 3 o'clock and count up going around. Now, you're going to find out real quickly that if the number is 4 or less, to make a nice, perfect, symmetrical diagram here, if the number is 4 or less, you're going to go ahead and put the dot directly at the 3, 6, 9, or 12 position. But if you've got 5 to 8, what does that tell you? Some of these positions are going to have two dots in it, right? So if I just had carbon and it was four, I know I can just go center it, center it, center it, center it. Nitrogen has five. That tells me I'm going to go all the way around and have one, one more, right? So over time, you'll learn to say, hey, I'm going to place my first dot, but I know there's going to be a fifth one, so I'm going to offset it a little bit to the side. Center this one, center this one, center this one, and there's my offset, number five. So initially, if you're, if, if you're just going center, 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 a little bit off, if you do it in pencil, erase it and center them, that's fine. If you're doing it in pen, not recommended. But if you do, start to think ahead. Hey, I know I'm going to come around here again. It's, if we were at oxygen and six, this one would have been offset, so I could take the second one there. And when you get really good at it, you'll go, hey, six is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. But that's how to draw a Lewis configuration or an electron dot configuration for any of the elements. Okay. Now let's take a look over on page 136, example 4.1. They go through drawing the Lewis structures for the following atoms. Sodium. 
You should see very quickly how they came up with this. Sodium. How many valence electrons does sodium have according to the periodic table? Find sodium. It's column. Column 1A. What's its con electron configuration? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Okay? I've got one valence electron. Where's it going to go? On the Lewis dot structure? One dot at the 3 o'clock position because that's where I start all the time. Later on, when we get a little more sophisticated, we start doing you know, we start doing molecules, you'll see where there might be times when you want to shift electrons around. But for right now, let's follow this basic pattern. So sodium is going to have one dot in the 3 o'clock position, and in your book it should show that. Other examples. GA. Next example it uses is this element, GA. What's its name? Do you know? I don't remember. Anyway, I'll look it up later. But GA, we don't really need to know the name of it in order to do the Lewis structure for it because GA is over here. How many valence electrons does it have? Three because it's in the th column 3A. Real quickly, we see that there's, it's in the fourth energy level. So I know that it's got the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p1. Right? It has three total valence electrons. Which means all that stuff we just rattled off about no electron configuration, ultimately what it gets us to is that it has three valence electrons in the fourth energy level. The 1s, or 4s1, 4s2, and 4p1. Those three dots, when we use the, s the method here, we write the symbol GA and count up our three. And since it's four or less, we know that they're all centered. One, two, three. And they use the example of TE. It's in the fifth energy level, column 6A. Column 6A means it has six valence electrons. Chemical symbol, TE. It's greater than four, so I know that I'm going to have to do some doubles. Two doubles, right? So I'm going to go ahead and start. Just do double, double. Single, single. Is that right? Now in the book, what does it say? It shows seven and says it has six, right? So what do you call that in the book? A typo. They're showing seven dots, and yet they say above it that it has six. So heads up. On the third example, third part of example 4.1, the diagram is wrong. On your own, let's go ahead and take a few minutes and try drawing the electron configuration, Lewis dot structures for calcium, silicon, and acetane. Take a few minutes to do it on your own, then I'll do them on the board if we'll talk through them. TE is tellurium. Hmm. Didn't know that. Tellurium. Okay. Tellurium and gallium. Okay. Okay. So 
So I don't see a lot of writing. So must, some of you have already been done, already done. Okay. So we're going to be building electron configuration or Lewis dot structures for calcium, silicon, and astatine. How many valence electrons are in calcium? Okay. Everybody agree? Two. Do you see that? Make sure you see that. That is two valence electrons in calcium. So I'm going to go over to my symbol, write calcium. Now I'm going to count up. Okay, count up starting at three o'clock position until I hit the number two. One, two, stop. Done. That's it. That's the electron dot structure, the Lewis dot structure for calcium. Now, let's go ahead and write out the full electron configuration. Oh, I know I heard that. So, let's see. What are we up to? 20. So, it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. There. We look across the highest energy level. One, two, two, three, three, four. Between one, two, three, and four, which is the biggest number? Four. What's my highest energy level? Four. How many electrons are associated with the number four? Just these two right there. And that's what I've indicated. Those two electrons are my valence electrons. Silicon. According to the periodic table, how many valence electrons are there? Okay, it's in column 4A. Okay, everybody, again, you see that. It's in column 4, so it has four valence electrons. So, I'm going to place four of them. It's four or less, so they're all going to be centered. So I'm not worried about the symmetry of my diagram, because the four are going to be one, two, three, and four. There, I've got all four of them. Let's write out the full electron configuration for silicon. It's got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3, eh, that won't work, 3s2, so we're here, 3p2. Okay, so I've got the numbers 1, 2, and 3, which is the biggest number? 3, good, 3, 3 is the biggest number. Yeah, micro collapse, everybody. Okay. Three is the biggest number. So how many electrons are associated with the third energy level in this configuration? I've got these two, and I've got these two. And two plus two. One, two, three, four. Column four. 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 Now, I'm not going to draw the whole thing out for astatine, right? 85 of them. But we could go through and draw out the full electron. Now that we know how, we could do it pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Five S two four D ten five P six six S two and we get into the F level after that. Five F fourteen six now, then it goes 
I think it's 4F14, then 5D10, then 6P6. Actually, we only go to 6P5. Okay? So there's the full electron configuration for astatine. So we've got one, two, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six different energy levels show up there, one through six, which is the highest. Six. How many electrons are associated with the sixth? These six S2s and these six P5s for a total of seven. Okay? So I know I'm going to have to place seven in four positions, which means every one except for one, the last one is going to have two. So I'm just think ahead and go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's my Lewis dot structure for astatine. Seven electrons in the valence shell. Okay. And so this whole big mess here that gives me seven tells me that because it has seven, it's going to behave very, very, very much like fluorine, which only has nine. It only has nine, but it also has seven valence shell electrons. And the chemistry comes from how many are in the valence not how many you have total. Okay? So the key is what's your valence count? What that's going to tell us here, looking a little bit forward, is hey, if I have seven, if it has seven in its valence, what is it thinking? Is it trying to get or get rid of? Does S T want to get rid of electrons or get electrons? How many is it trying to have? Eight. It's going to try to get one more. Calcium. How many does calcium want to have? Astatine's way over here. Okay. Calcium has two. How many does calcium want to have? It wants to have eight. So would you think it's going to try to fight for six or get rid of two? It's going to get rid of two. It's going to get rid of two. And that is the fundamental difference between metals and nonmetals. Metals want to get rid of electrons. Nonmetals want to get electrons. That's why we have the stair step. Yeah. And then we'll get into the D as well. And these behave all funky too. These have weird characteristics because the D level of the lesser fills up before the, the greater. All right. Just as a heads up, we're going to start doing review problems, practice problems, review questions, things like that as we go through the module. So I can't assign homework by policy for tomorrow, right? But I can sign homework for Thursday, beginning tonight, and I can sign more tomorrow due Thursday, right? So I'm not telling you you have to do this tonight. You can do it tomorrow night if you want. But it'll be part of what's due on Friday. So far, we have learned enough in here to do review questions one through five. And practice problem one. So review questions one through five and practice problem one at a minimum will do, be due Friday. Based on what we get through tomorrow, we'll add to that. You can choose to do all of it Thursday night if you want. But technically, I'm not assigning you any homework for tomorrow. 